Welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. Featuring sys admin expert, Don Pizzette. DevOps engineer, Justin Dennison. Security specialist, Daniel Lowry. And Peter. Hello and welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. We are still socially distancing here. I'm, I'm kind of expecting at this point this is the new normal and I don't know if we'll ever get back um, to all at one table, but uh, but hopefully, because I uh, we've got all these guys here. We've got Don Pizzette up there. Don, how you doing? I am doing great, and boy, I tell you, I uh, I don't know. I, I I don't necessarily need the close proximity to you guys. Yeah, it, ever. It's kind of nice. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's it's a heavier lift for the you know guys behind the scenes, but you know, Justin's got his fan. Justin, how you doing with your fan over there? I'm doing fantastic, and I tell you what, I'm saving a bunch of money on deodorant, so <laughs> great. I like this arrangement as well. I feel like I wear socks like once a week now. <laughs> so, uh, detergent bills going way down. And, and Daniel, how about you? How are you doing up there? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking, Peter. Uh, and yes, I as well get to uh, enjoy the distance from my stinky counterparts. We're all just finding out we don't like each other. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I'm glad we came together yeah. to do this. Today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, here's, well, here's another person we, we may or may not like uh, joining us today. Uh, we have Mike Weber, who's the vice president of Coal Fire. Mike, how are you doing? Very good. How are you? Uh, I'm good, and, and I'm just curious, for those that are watching on video, what is behind you? You know, this is the, behind me is a collection of, uh, of tchotchkes uh, that I picked up uh, from, mostly from overseas. There's some uh, African motif things uh, mixed in with some shells from Hawaii, as well as uh, uh, a couple other things that are completely unrelated. To okay, that. so it's, okay. The colors yeah, match the wall. I thought gotcha. it was a lamp. Oh, I was looking <laughs> at the other side, Daniel. Oh. <laughs> there's, it looks like Don thought were medieval weapons. Uh, oh no! Okay. no. Uh, one is a walking stick. So, uh, well, I you mean, can do some damage with a walking stick. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd take a hit to the head with a walking yeah, stick. Raccoon gets <laughs> in your way or something. Yeah. Well, great. Well, uh, I mean, I know that that now we feel like we know Mike much better. But let's go ahead and jump in with our first segment: rapid fire questions. Who do you work for? What's new? Who are you? What's happening? What's wrong with you? All right, Mike, so this is going to be five minutes. You have 45 seconds to a minute to answer each question. You run over time. Peter's going to buzz you, and we're going to move on. And Peter's going to take our first question. Yeah, Mike, so uh, one of the things we're doing here in June is we're talking to everybody about how they got started in IT. So I'm curious if you can kind of uh, take us back a little bit on your journey, how you got to where you are today. Sure. So it's a really long journey. I don't know if it fits in 45 seconds, but I'll <laughs> do my best. Um, a long time ago, I uh, wanted to be a rock star, um, and I ran out of gigs before I uh, had enough money to pay that month's rent. Uh, so I got into the uh, lucrative uh, field of, uh, of restaurants, <laughs> of hospitality. Um, I worked my way through there, ended up with a job in their point of sale support department, uh, capitalized on my education, my background, uh, and then moved into uh, an organization, got a job with an organization that uh, I was working QA and development, um, and then got my first job in security. Well, that, that was, you, I think you did it. You accomplished it. And, you know, now these days, it seems from, from what I've been told that you lean more toward the red team. And I know what my take would be on it. But how did you end up there versus focusing on kind of blue team ops? So I was, uh, I was in operations in blue team ops and security operations centers for uh, several years, um, but always uh, favored the attacker side. Um, when working in a defensive cap capability, seeing I was enamored with what uh, what the offensive side could do, uh, so I self-directed uh, and self-studied into uh, that side of the house um, to get there myself. Um, as far as uh, my place where I work now, Coal Fire, um, they specialize in the offensive side, so it's a really good fit. Now, I know there's a lot of different security companies that are out there, but Coal Fire is uh, borderline a household name because you guys made it onto the news radar a few months back when a couple of your uh, pen testers got detained at a courthouse in Oklahoma. Would you mind giving us an update? Like, where are they at now? Or, you know, how's that legal battle going? Yeah, I'm sorry. You'll have to refresh my mind. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this uh, this issue happened. Uh, it was actually in uh, the state of Iowa. Um, we were uh, under contract to the state of Iowa to do uh, penetration testing, including red teaming with uh, physical access. Uh, long story short, uh, the guys who were on the engagement got to uh, got to a little trouble um, gaining access to one of the facilities. Um, but uh, the way it worked out is that cooler heads prevailed and uh, all charges were dropped and uh, we're back to normal. Um, Justin and Gary, uh, the two uh, staff members that were on that engagement, are going to be speaking about it uh, at Black Hat 
um, coming this summer. Well, I look forward to that. I, I've heard them talk about it before, and it was super compelling to hear their story and even a little bit of uh, making you feel like you're going crazy. Now, that being said, shifting gears a little bit, I, I love security. That's what I do around here is, is to try to help people learn security so they can get into that field. But as someone who's in that field and constantly sees things and probably sees them repetitively, what's the most creative thing that you've seen recently in a sea of uh, ubiquity? You know, that's, it's really interesting. Um, what we've been seeing lately from across the board um, in general uh, are issues configuring existing services that already are in theory secure if, if configured correctly. So it's, it's really interesting that there aren't necessarily attack vectors that are creative, but they're attack vectors that capitalize on uh, misconfiguration of systems. Uh, typically we see this in cloud environments, but if you want to talk about one of the things that I really found uh, to be one of the most creative examples and the best use of, uh, of uh, I'm going to say offensive or hacking uh, activities, was uh, it obviously happened many years ago, but it's the uh, emails that for that are forged that are asking uh, individuals to act on behalf of a leader within the company to be able to wire transfer. So that uh, that wire transfer uh, false email or fraudulent campaign um, that was one of the best um, <laughs> uh, perspectives on how to use the level of access and the information uh, to be able to make a believable uh, a believable ruse. To be able to get money transferred. Yeah, they only fooled me twice with that one. So <laughs> not going to happen again. Hey, so I'm curious, Mike. So, uh, like vice president, you know, at, in the government level, you're just like ribbon cutting and shaking hands and stuff. What 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 do you do like day to day at Coal Fire? Uh, I've been I've recently moved into a new role. So my role uh, I was in uh, operations, vice president of operations, Coal Fire Labs. Uh, I've been I've transitioned uh, into a role where I'm vice president of innovation. So. I get to make stuff up. It's kind of fun. Um, I get to lead our R and D team. Uh, I get to uh, help develop a go to market strategy and product definition for new products and services uh, within Coal Fire. And uh, I, I kind of like it. It gets back to uh, my artistic roots. So you can get hired to make stuff up. <laughs> Usually that's called uh, politics. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> Journalism. Well, hmm, <laughs> might, have to, yeah. might have to dip my toe into that land because I can make something yeah. up with the best of them. You heard you have to get into music first, then the restaurant business, I believe it was. Right. Then pen testing. Right. I pen mean, testing. is going to restaurants frequently count as getting into the restaurant business? <laughs> now, aren't you supposed to actually work at the restaurant business as an aspiring musician? Like not wait until <laughs> after? Yeah. Yeah, it's... It's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, hey, you told me 45 seconds, all right? Let's right. Bring it down. All right. Well, uh, speaking of innovation, it's it's rare that we will actually create a new segment based on a story, but uh, we're, we're like, this doesn't fit into any of our other segments, so we've got to create a whole new concept because we want to talk about something really cool with you. So we've got a brand new segment called Weird Science. That's amazing. Well, look at that. That is broke. Uh, kudos to Justin for uh, <laughs> oh, sample man. some of Justin for the intro there. Uh, so, so Mike, we want to talk about something that uh, that we saw where uh, you guys were setting 3D printers on fire remotely. So, uh, first of all, how, how does that even how does that idea even come up? That hey, I bet we could do this. It's the force. So, yeah, that was the concept. We uh, we're you know have it sitting around. Uh, at work, chatting, dreaming, um, and uh, talking about ways we could uh, look at the whole world of the Internet of Things and what we can do. Because um, when we look at consumer level devices and uh, you know industrial devices, there's a pretty big uh, difference between these two things. And there's a there's a lot of work done by uh, um, done by uh, members of the community on, on uh, hacking cars, which is excellent work that they did. And that's a pretty big deal. Um, but we wanted to see some see if you could do something that was a little more um, I'd say widespread and cause that same kind of kinetic effect. So um, when looking at the IoT devices that we could possibly uh, look at, there are cameras and there are uh, you know, uh, telemetry type systems, but um, 3D printers have heat involved and they melt things. So we thought maybe we can demonstrate a kinetic problem uh, by being able to hack a printer. And that's how we how that idea was born. I mean, I'm thinking of the server room and everything's hot in there. So, I mean, obviously, you know, it's kind of funny to be like, oh, 3D printers, you can set them on fire. That's kind of cool. But then you start to think, 
that's kind of scary. I mean, what are the implications of this? Is this something that could be, uh, you know, you could uh, replicate on, on different devices? Uh, well, it, you know, this, the, the printer had a heating element. It's meant to get hot. Yeah. All we had to do was abuse the fact that it could get hot by eliminating any governors um, and making it get as hot as it possibly could. So that was the, uh, that was the purpose of it. Um, and uh, it, we wanted to make sure that we could do it remotely because if you had to do it by actually disassembling the printer, it's not going to be much of a hack. So mm -hmm. our objective was to be able to do this uh, at least you know, someplace outside of the facility that has a printer in it and uh, work from there. Is this a well-known printer that we might all <laughs> mess around with and learn? It from? isn't. Um, it was a printer. Um, we've got the name of it in our blog post, so I will go ahead and mention it here. It's uh, made by Flashforge, and it isn't an insecure printer. Um, it isn't, uh, there isn't, isn't a problem with the company. It isn't a problem with the printer. Um, it's just a problem with how the technology is implemented. Now, you mentioned the governors that you removed. Were those, is that implemented in software and that's why you're able to disable them? Or, because I'm thinking of like physical servers. A lot of physical servers will have uh, temperature sensors and go into thermal shutdown. That's all done in hardware, so it's really hard to bypass. Right. This uh, there's obviously a hardware limitation to it, um, but what the, the it was it was governed uh, primarily through the firmware. So uh, we intercepted, we did man, man in the middle attack uh, and over the air update to replace the firmware uh, out of a copy that we had pulled off and reverse engineered and rebuilt, um, replace the firmware and then able to uh, activate it and uh, make it uh, fire up. And we are just posting our third uh, blog post in the series of three um, uh, of how we went about doing it, uh, including the video of uh, a smoking melting plastic. So is Not this how actually get flame? <laughs> so is this how your name for came about? Like coal fire? Do you just like set stuff on fire all the time? Yeah. Coal fire. Yeah, coal <laughs> fire. Uh, so this Catchy would validate project. This would validate. I, so I used to be a high school teacher. I had some three D printers, and I got written up for having one of them plugged in. Uh, and he was like, "This is a fire hazard," and I was like, eh. "But you know, here we go. It could be. Could it? Could be set we, it on fire." We, we could melt plastic and theoretically, if this was in a home office type situation or even an office situation where there may be something flammable around, it could catch fire and set the whole place on fire. That's where I keep my oily rags on top of the 3D <laughs> printer. So I am curious, like, how many Saw printers us. did you destroy while doing this research? Three. Three. <laughs> what made you choose that specific printer? Um, it was uh, a combination of having uh, components made, uh, some components made overseas, um, affordability of the printer, because clearly if we're going to destroy three, we don't want to keep throwing money, <laughs> burning money, as it were. $60,000 um, a printer. <laughs> right. So we wanted to get something affordable, something that we would, that was a fairly common uh, system that we, you know, might have some you know, reason to suspect it may not be as, uh, as you know, thoroughly vetted as some from, you know, some major printer manufacturers. And it was made out of gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why the uh, input area said oily rags. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's funny because Peter's talking about it being on top of a printer. You just bundle up a bunch of oily rags, they'll catch fire spontaneously anyway. Yeah, give them enough time. And this is Florida. Yeah. I mean, it'll happen. So uh, I, I did hear, though, in, in an interview you did on Security Weekly, you were kind of talking about some other implications of stuff like this, where um, you, you were mentioning something about, like, if you can keep flipping the switch, was it on a mainframe or something, and get it to you know, possibly overheat or, or I mean, it, you think about damage from hacks right now as, as loss of data, but do you see us kind of going in this direction of um, attacks being more on, on actual physical uh, equipment? Sure. As more uh, industrial uh, systems are connected to the internet, absolutely. Uh, we saw this a long time ago. Uh, I, I did some time, so to speak, at, uh, at uh, uh, the Department of Energy and I uh, was up at Idaho National Labs where they had done the studies on the generators where they're able to gain access to uh, the network that generate these uh, large diesel generators are, are uh, connected to. And they would just uh, send Modbus commands and flip them on and off and on and off and on and off until they just blew themselves up from all the vibration. Um, and that was, uh, that was a long time ago uh, before, uh, before uh, there was a push to secure all of the critical infrastructure uh, within the U S uh, we've seen that and we've seen uh Stuxnet, which is uh, several years old now, uh, yet uh, also uh, a kinetic effect of a cyber hack. Yeah, I guess maybe the data is more valuable now, so that's that's what they're going after. But man, 2020 just keeps getting better. Now I got to worry about just my computer being set right. on fire by, by hackers. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, you should probably get that 3D printer of yours out of that <laughs> bucket of gasoline. I should. Yeah. yeah, it's under my bed. That's so yeah. stupid. Yeah, it's a pretty big jump to go from something that has a heating element to something that doesn't. Yeah. But, I mean, hey, if you can man in the middle of Flash firmware update, then you could easily brick somebody's laptop or permanently disable it. Are you sure my laptop battery doesn't have a heating element? <laughs> the battery itself is a heating element. Yeah, I feel like I've cooked eggs on this thing before. Uh, well, so where can people find that blog post? You mentioned it a couple times. Uh, we are, it's out on coalfire.com in our blog uh, section. Um, there are three of them. Uh, I believe we have them linked together, uh, but that po that post is coming out uh, at the end of this week uh, by the 25th or 26th. Awesome. And so is this podcast. So look at that. It's, and uh, so what else is going on right now at, at Coalfire? You, you've got some new product launches you mentioned? Uh, we have. We have just uh, put together a product called Threat Modeling and Attack Simulation. Um, and that takes uh, ultimately the uh, art of penetration testing, red teaming and purple teaming, uh, and combines it with uh, doing organizational threat modeling. So one can put together attack simulations that demonstrate the effectiveness of security investments. Um, it, it can uh, prove out where security investment needs to be increased uh, in certain cases, or uh, could even be overkill in others. So it's a, a new service for organizations with uh, fairly mature uh, or uh, information security programs. Okay, so I'm the noob over here, so uh, help me out. What, what is purple teaming? Because I'm, I'm familiar with red and blue teams and their roles, but what's, where's purple fit in? Sure. So purple is the combination of red and blue. So a red team, historically speaking, um, has been, you know, offensive. And it's been all about, uh, you know, getting the quickest path to rooting a company up um, by taking any attack vector. Uh, the blue team, on the other hand, that's the team that's defending against these attacks, uh, which are uh, trying to keep that from happening. Now, purple team engagement or purple team style engagement, like our attack simulations in our threat modeling and attack simulation product, um, the purple style uh, uh, engagement means that we have complete transparency into the red team's uh, attacks, attacking a specific uh, technique or procedure that's be it that a that a threat a threat actor would be taking uh, against the organization to identify where a blue team's analytics and detection capability uh, are suitable to be able to detect this or you know are have a gap. So it's very uh, the purple is the cooperation between the red and the blue teams on these engagements. And finally, you mentioned uh, was it Justin and Gary? They're speaking at it was Black Hat. They are at Black Hat um, this uh, August. All right, yeah, and that's all happening virtually now so uh, definitely check that out if you if you did see that story originally like we did and uh you know want to know what's going on with that and uh you know there were a lot of questions because the journalism isn't always complete and so we're wondering did they have the uh statement of work with them was you know what are all these uh, uh were all these measures taken did they alert people and how do they get into this so uh i'm sure we'll oh, yeah. get a lot of answers from that yep awesome well thank you uh so much mike for uh for taking the time with us today you bet and, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and uh, use the break here to unplug Justin's 3D printer that's at his, at his desk. <laughs> and uh, we'll be right back. But stay tuned. we got more Technado coming up right after this. Do you know what's better than being an IT Pro TV member? Being a member for free. Hi, I'm Dom Pazette, co-founder and edutainer here at IT Pro TV. Once you sign up for an IT Pro TV personal membership subscription, you'll automatically be part of our referral program. Then all you have to do is share your personal referral link and code with your friends and colleagues. Every time one signs up, you get money off your subscription. Sign up enough and your membership is free. That's right, access to all your favorite IT training, totally free. Kind of feels like stealing, doesn't it? Check out the link below to learn how to get your code and start sharing today. All right, welcome back to TechNado with Don Pazette, and thank you to Mike for joining us. We've been looking forward to that for a while, ever since I was told we were going to talk about 3D printers catching on fire, and it did not disappoint, and I'm looking forward to checking out those videos as well. Is there an open position like that here where I can just make stuff up? The making uh, director of making stuff up? Marketing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I was going to say, we, that's... Yeah. That they're they're oh, position no, taken. I feel like his is different than that. <laughs> I feel like his is... is, is is not making stuff soul up. sucking. There's, there's marketing and there's accounting, like two entire departments that do that on a regular basis. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> I know my boss listens, so I will say that uh, that is not what I do at all. <laughs> doesn't watch. She's a video, listener. So. Is can't see the winking. Yeah. Yeah. Watching YouTube doesn't count as making stuff up. No. <laughs> yeah, got to go on Reddit again, you know, because we're promoting things on there. Do you see this kitten? Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, an IT adorable. kitten. Look at it that. It thinks it's people. It's uh. using its paws. <laughs> oh, man, you know what? I got so caught up in the uh, 
in the talk about burning 3D printers, I didn't even get to use this sound. They taste like burning out. Oh. <laughs> like I had, and you gave me a fire marshal bill uh, clip, and way to go! Oh man, now that's you have you have one job, like yeah. one thing to do. No, but make stuff up. <laughs> that's to fill in when 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 people aren't interesting to talk to. Yeah, yeah. that is true. Like right now. Hey, uh, let's get to our first uh, news article here from Ars Technica. Apple announces Mac OS 11, Big Sur, with an emphasis on design. The next big version of Mac OS has been announced at WWDC. Is that going on right now? Because I know people were talking about uh, some new watch updates and stuff. So that, that's happening now, right? It is. Yep. It, it started on Monday, and it goes technically it goes on all week. It's an all-online event, not an in-person one for the first time in a long, long time, uh, maybe ever. Uh, but most of the big announcements came yesterday, and one of those was that Mac OS 11 is the next version, not Mac OS 10.16, which is what everybody thought going into this, uh, because Apple has been incrementing for so long on the numbers. Uh, but they've decided it's big enough to jump to 11. Uh, and a big part of that is Mac OS 11 Big Sur doesn't have a lot of big engineering changes under the hood. In fact, almost every change they announced is graphical, visual on the front end. So, you know, the windows are, they have rounded corners and you have a control center like you have on the iPhone or iPad is now in Mac OS as well. So you can swipe down. Well, you can't swipe because they still don't do a touchscreen for whatever reason, but you can bring down this little control panel and you can toggle wireless on and off and all that. So, not a uh, not a huge change. Although they do say it's the where, where's the quote? It's an entirely new interface. It's actually the same interface that we've always had. It just looks a little different. So I wouldn't say entirely new. It's not like they rewrote it from scratch. But that is coming. Uh, we'll see it come out in August or September. As a developer, all I can think of is entirely new interface, which actually means you have to learn a whole new UI toolkit in order to build new Mac OS. I'm hoping that's not the case. That, I'm not saying that's actually what happened, but yeah, the the images it was just like oh, well, it's border radius, and is that also marketing? Would marketing be responsible for the weird border <laughs> radius? I believe so. There there are some people clamoring right now saying that Apple is no longer able to innovate, and that these subtle little changes might be what they consider a big change now, and that's not a good sign for the company. And then we'll have to see. Time will tell. Uh, but there's no no real significant advancement with Mac OS 11. It, it does seem like they're just doing some sort of weird, covert move from, like, everything we do is just basically an iPad now, so let's just call it what it is. I mean, the interface now has a an interface that's like the iPad. It's starting to look more like the iPad or the iPhone, that iOS look and feel. I mean, is that... Is that what they're doing? It's so funny because they, they keep saying over and over again, we are not getting rid of Mac OS. We are not merging Mac OS and iOS or iPad OS. We are keeping them separate. But then now they've changed Mac OS to look like iPad OS, and they've made it where iPad apps can run on Mac OS. So while they're saying they're not merging it, they are just changing it to look more and more and more like an iPad. And so at some point... It just doesn't make sense to maintain two separate operating systems that look identical and run the same apps. That's crazy. So unless they've lost their minds, <laughs> one of these OSs is going to go away in the near future. Uh, I can't wait to see the the crazy come out of the head of Tim Cook. Just... <laughs> it, they've also got slightly darker mode in this version. Slightly darker <laughs> mode. Oh, they, well, I take back everything I said. It's a must-have oh, now. Oh, got to get it, man. That's why it jumped. Don, what do you got me on this piece of crap for? Is I it, know. Is that also gray mode? Is slightly yeah. darker just gray mode? It's similar, yeah. yeah. It's Most the powerful mode. Mac OS ever. Yeah. And then there's a super white mode that's just actually... A just, flashlight. Just, it's a it's a halogen flashlight. That's right just the uh, the wallpaper is just Justin's face. Yeah. yeah. Like well, it uses so much more power. Yeah. Dude, uh, yeah. Fire all that white. All right. Well, we've got another announcement uh, from WWDC. It looks like here on Tom'sHardware.com, Apple will move Mac to custom silicon details transition from Intel. So we, we were talking. Last week or the week before Just, about the move the, to the, the ARM chips, is this, this is a continuation of that discussion? Yes, so it was rumored that Apple was going to be transitioning over to ARM. That is no longer a rumor. They have confirmed that it is their intent over the next two years to move each and every Mac over to their own internal processor. So that means, uh, you know, it, 
uh, Apple has been doing ARM processors in the iPad and iPhone for quite some time. No, uh, but they don't. You know, they don't label them as ARM processors. They call it like their A7, their A8, their A9. And so we're gonna see. I, I, they didn't really say a name, so an A10 or A11 or A12, whatever it is, uh, in their desktops, in their laptops, in all of their products. That's a big transition because now you're changing architecture from the x86, the Intel-based architecture, over to ARM. It's not the first time Apple has done this, right? Years ago when they moved from PowerPC over to Intel, they did it. And I made the comment the other week that I... I don't know how they can do this and, and claim to maintain performance. So I was really looking forward to the announcement. And sure enough, they didn't let me down with enough marketing jargon in here that is completely unbelievable. Uh, so, for example, they're saying that uh, in many scenarios, you will find that your applications run even faster under ARM, which is really just not true. Uh, ARM processors are traditionally not faster than Intel. But on an iPhone or on an iPad, they look faster because you're only running one app at a time, right? You, you only have one app in focus. On an iPad, you can start to do split screen now and have two apps going, but that's about it. On a desktop, you might have 10, 12 apps running all at the same time, and that's going to be a big deal. So where I'm curious is with these new ARM processors, how many cores are they going to have? Because with Intel, it was always temperature and size that held them back from doing a ton of cores. But with ARM... They could do 24 or 32 cores in a laptop, and now you will get some better performance. You will see some really impressive stuff. Uh, but they announced that they are releasing Rosetta 2, an emulator to allow x86 code to run on top of ARM, and a number of other things to help that transition. But they will continue selling Intel-based Macs for the next two years. So this is not an immediate changeover. Let me Does this mean that I'm going to lose the ability to get 32 gigabytes of RAM in, a, in like a MacBook? Not necessarily. Uh, you know, ARM doesn't preclude having large amounts of memory. Uh, some people are under that impression because of like the Raspberry Pis that ran ARM, and they were 32-bit for so long, so they were capped at four gigs. But there are Linux ARM builds that run 64-bit that can have a terabyte of RAM. The only reason I ask is, uh, I think it was in this article, or it might have been another article that led to this. They have like the developer kit that they're going to start selling to like help developers start moving their apps over. And then Rosetta 2 was talked about that it translates Intel code to ARM code on the fly. I would be interested to see how that actually works. Um, but the developer kit is like a Mac Mini, and then it had a like a BR chip or a BZ13 chip, but then only 16 gigabytes of RAM. But I wondered, because sometimes those builds, they can chew up memory. Um, so I was wondering, like, oh, I wonder if they're just going to go, well, we don't really need them because we're going to move to this different architecture that, that changes how things are just built. I don't know. Yeah, their, their quick start kit that you're talking about, uh, it's running an A12Z uh, as the processor, so it's got one of Apple's Intel processors, I mean, uh, ARM processors, uh, and it does only have 16 gigs of RAM, but that doesn't mean that that's the cap. And their idea there is that it's just for developers developing a single application. So 16 gigs should be most uh, or should be enough for what most developers need to create and manage one application in a dev environment. We'll we'll see as time goes on. Like they haven't announced the actual products. I expect we'll see those in August and September at the big hardware event. Uh, and so then we'll we'll get an idea of what's going to be possible. I'm really keeping an eye out for how many cores, but RAM is also important. I, I wonder uh, as far as Xcode because they have their own like build toolkit. Um, that's going to be more focused toward ARM because you're going to get an update to Xcode and all the uh, associated libraries, I'm sure. But Xcode allowed me to build things that weren't Apple specific. I wonder, you think Rosetta 2 will allow me to build for Intel platforms if it's not an Apple product? I don't know. I, I'm kind of confused on this one because Apple had that rule for a long time that, like, if you wanted to build an iOS app, you had to run Xcode on a Mac, right? And when you had an Intel CPU, in theory, there are ways you could make that happen on a Windows machine and, and get a compile to go. But now that they're going to a whole new hardware architecture, if you're on an Intel Mac, can you compile an ARM app? I, you should be able to. You can compile iPhone apps that way. So I, I, I would imagine you'll be able to do that. But we'll have to see where that one goes because it, it could go a few different ways. The other thing is that for the most part, ARM processors have only been able to emulate 32-bit Intel code, as far as I'm aware. Apple didn't say whether or not they found a way to emulate 64-bit Intel code on ARM. And they just did the big push last year to force everybody to go all 64-bit on their Intel apps. So most developers aren't maintaining a 32-bit fork anymore. 
So if this is a 32-bit emulator, then it's not going to help most people. But they did say they've already started working with Microsoft and Adobe on getting their applications ported over. Microsoft said they already had Word and Excel ported and done. Uh, so they're making some pretty fast movement there on the major products. And uh, I imagine everybody else will follow behind. So I just send them in my, my laptop then? Is that how I get the new chip? A trade-in? Yeah, I don't think they do that. I'm just going to send it back? All right. <laughs> uh, all right, now we're going to move on now from the Apple world to bleepycomputer.com, where we see hackers use Google Analytics to steal credit cards and bypass CSP, uh, which is content security policy. I had to, to look in the article for that. Um, so this, this is scary as a marketer because uh, they're coming after us now, right, in, in Google Analytics. I should be... I should be afraid. So this is an interesting one because, uh, you know, credit card skimmers online, uh, it was at Magecart uh, attacks have been really prevalent the last few years. And one thing they have to do is they have to get some kind of script or whatever to compromise a server. But then the other part is they've got to exfiltrate that data and get it out. And usually that's how they get detected. You see your web server sending data to places that it shouldn't send. Well, they've come up with a creative attack where they're able to leverage Google Analytics because most servers whitelist Google Analytics. And so they can use cross-site scripting attacks and basically reflect that data to extract uh, credit card information and send it back through Google Analytics in a way that is very difficult to detect on the network. Now, before the podcast, I, I swung by and talked to Daniel and just said, can you take a look at this and tell me how practical this is? So Daniel, what, what's your take on this? Uh, yeah, it's like super practical. What was funny was when I started looking into exactly how they were uh, achieving their end goal. They're using what's called CSPs, which are content security policy headers that get passed uh, along through your HTTP GET requests and whatnot, right? So what's interesting is when you set the CSP, you basically say, hey, anything that originates from me, like same origin, it's cool. But anything that's out, that's not me, that's not cool because I don't know where that's coming from. But a lot of times these companies get into whitelisting things like Google Analytics because, hey, I trust Google. I want to be able to do analytics. I want to have that functionality. And the problem comes in with the limitation of the CSP itself. So they have these things called directives. And that's basically how you say, hey, uh, I've got like scripts source is going to equal self and then Google Analytics.com, right? Well, once that becomes whitelisted, it just looks at that domain and it doesn't look at any kind of query string that might come after that. It sees you know, googleanalytics.com and googleanalytics.com question mark such and such and then a bunch of query string data along with it as the exact same thing. So you can just change the ID to change to your Google Analytics ID, which you can sign up for for free and have yourself a Google Analytics account. And then once you start manipulating that data, it starts getting exfiltrated. It just comes back to you. They base64 encode this stuff. So that it comes back. It actually seems very... Um, pragmatic and practical to be able to do this uh, type of attack. And of course, they're skimming for credit card information and PII, grabbing that info and then uh, using it to their little malicious heart's content as they would. But it, it didn't seem super difficult to actually set up. You just had to know what the uh, query string looks like and manipulate it. And uh, once your code got injected, you're good to go. I will say the best day, if you look back at our our Google Analytics for IT Pro TV was when we had a DDoS attack. So, <laughs> <laughs> as a marketer, you know, you're just like, hey, numbers are up. Yeah. <laughs> Things Look are at good. these metrics. Yeah. So, it's funny about the Google Analytics because I set up a firewall at my house recently to, to work on some IoT things. And so, I set up a Google Analytics here to play around because that whole marketing analytics stack is just ripe for someone doing exactly what they did because like there, there's other things that intentionally inject executable code to further push out analytics and i'm like well most of the time we try to prevent that <laughs> um but when i set up my firewall by default it was blocking google analytics so i was trying to check google analytics at the house and it was like absolutely not no and then i i thought just for a moment maybe i should wipe you know just, just allow it and you know what i'm glad i didn't it's funny. It's kind of like uh, saying, you know what? I trust Google. Google has a great service that I want to take a part of. And it's because I trust them, I'm going to take the key to my kingdom here. I'm going to put it on the outside of this fence that I just locked and write for Google only. And then, you know, because then only Google can use it, right? That's true. Yeah. I think that's how it works. Yep. That's called oopsies. <laughs> Is that wrong? No. Yeah, that's Oops. wrong. Hey, well, uh, it's actually a good segue. I, I, uh, 
I went out of order on the stories, but um, speaking of DDoS attacks, let's go back. Uh, Amazon says it mitigated the largest DDoS attack ever recorded, an attack with a previously unseen volume of 2.3 uh, it's terabytes per second, which is crazy. This is over at TheVerge.com. So, um, I mean, I, I've been using Amazon recently, and I, did, I didn't notice any any downtime was there was there downtime associated with this there wasn't and that's kind of the amazing part about this uh you know there was an article that was submitted for last week's show that i passed on because it wasn't confirmed yet about how the united states may be under a large ddos attack and it turns out that it wasn't the united states as a whole it was mostly focused on amazon so i'm glad we waited until this week uh amazon has not said exactly what was targeted so it may have been a particular amazon service or it may have been a particular Amazon customer, somebody who ho was hosting their infrastructure on Amazon. So, for example, uh, Netflix still has a really big presence on Amazon. Uh, several other sites like that. Uh, I think it's is it Twitter that still has a lot of presence on Amazon. So, it, you know, it may have been one of them that was targeted. But they broke the previous record. The previous record was actually a 1.7 terabit attack that Netscout Arbor was able to mitigate. Uh, in this case, Amazon was receiving a consistent 2.3 terabits of traffic flooding into their network, and they were able to withstand that. They have a huge amount of bandwidth, and their Amazon Shield was able to detect and block a lot of this stuff. So that was really impressive that they were able to do it. Um, they did provide a little bit of details that this was actually the result of a reflection attack, and they were targeting LDAP servers, most likely Active Directory servers, that they were uh, they had formulated a way to be able to send a forged packet at a CLDAP server, and that server would reply with more data than was sent to it, and they would just set a falsified source address so it would all get sent over to Amazon. And it ended up generating a huge amount of, tax, uh, of uh, traffic. Amazon said that on average, 99% of the attacks they receive are 43 gigabits or smaller. But in this case... When you're talking about 2.3 terabits per second of traffic, that's a huge, huge DDoS. This is uh, an amplifi amplification attack very similar to the Memcached uh, ones that, that GitHub had to fight against, right? Yeah, and there's a lot of different providers out there have worked really hard to secure that, you know, to, to make Memcache is, is already a kind of a sensitive service as it is. So a lot of people brought that onto their radar and got them to start paying a lot more attention and securing that service better. I feel like this was maybe perpetrated by Amazon itself to <laughs> show how robust their system was. So, you know, look at us, man. We got hit with the largest DDoS in the ever world has ever seen. We just took it like it was nothing, kept on rocking. You didn't, you could buy books and and rent movies and stuff, and you, you know, know. It, it would be a great marketing play. Yeah, it, Peter's it, already got his little. It head sounds there, like right? a marketer went, "Hey, so here's a up. We got to figure out how this Amazon Shield works. We got to let people know about it. <laughs> Are you ready? What we're gonna do? You got a bunch of them LDAP servers running. All right, here's what we're gonna do: amplification attack. Let's bring ourselves down, but not really. We're gonna use the shield, and then it's gonna be glorious. So for a moment, I thought, all right, well, you know, maybe we could release a press release on Monday and say that. Techne.do resisted an eight terabits attack, yeah. and you know who would know? But uh, you actually can see the traffic wow. on the backbones. You know the overall network traffic D doesn't mean Amazon didn't cause it themselves. They could have, right? But there is a you know it is documented that a huge amount of traffic was sent that way, uh, and independent auditors were able to see that as well. Well, originally they thought it was attack on the U.S., but maybe it was an attack by the U.S. because you know Trump and Bezos have not. Uh, <laughs> So. It's going to be the most amazing attack. You know what it was? I bet it was huge. those 5G towers. Yeah. Oh, it's probably 5G. Oh, yeah. Didn't even think about that. Golly. Nailed 5G it. towers. Nailed it. Not this Nailed one because it. it's burst. They cause COVID and now they're hacking stuff. Well, we got to ask Mike Weber if they can make 5G towers burn remotely. Listen, you just got to get that, that USB key. You're good to go. Is there a heating element in a 5G? Amazon tower? bought a bunch <laughs> of them bad boys. That Jeff Bezos got some money. Yeah. Because it's got to heat up the COVID before it sends it out. Yeah, True. yeah. Because if you don't properly bake it, COVID, you can't get people to catch it. COVID yeah. is a dish best served warm. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, like that. Scary. Oh man, I tell you, I, I feel compelled to say all of that was lies. Everybody listening <laughs> to this point, all of that is lies. Next week, somebody's going to we'll have time. We'll they're going to slap this. that together. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a cut together political campaign and be like, "Look at here, Techne.do confirms." <laughs> I'm like, "No, that's." 
Ah, whatever. <laughs> Dominican IT news site. <laughs> <laughs> Technado claims that uh, 5G towers have heating uh, elements. And, and now, we, now we have intercontinental ballistic missiles on the way to the Dominican Republic. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that escalated. It, yeah, it did. <laughs> it did get out of control, but I like it. I like it. Good out of control. Uh, All right. Uh, our last article here is from ZDNet.com. Windows 10 uh, says Chrome and Edge slash RAM use thanks to this Microsoft backend change. Microsoft's project reunion effort unlocks a potentially huge memory use reduction for Google Chrome and Edge. And so Google Chrome has been just notoriously a, a resource hog. And I guess Edge would be now, too, because that's on the Chromium I'm pretty platform. sure this is all right. Lie. This sounds, <laughs> it's a lot. sounds like fairy tales. Like I believe COVID tower. comes from 5G towers before someone figured <laughs> out how to reduce the memory consumption in Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will say, if, if you open up Chrome with one tab, and that tab is just the Google Chrome tab, not even the Google website, it takes a gig of RAM. Uh, and the binary is not even that big, so it is a, a mysterious thing how much memory it consumes. But one advantage of Microsoft moving Edge over to the Chromium core is that Microsoft is now taking active steps to make it better, whereas Google never gave two craps about it. So now we're actually seeing some improvements. Microsoft has already implemented those changes in Edge, and they've seen up to a 27% reduction in memory consumption. So Edge is already benefiting from that. What this article, I don't think it ever mentions it in here, is that the ball is now in Google's court. So Google can choose to take advantage of those changes. And like add it into the Chromium platform, basically? Yeah. Okay. O or not. They don't have to. It's an optional flag that they can enable. So Google could actually flip them the bird and say, no, we, we want that 27% extra memory. <laughs> and, uh, and and we'll see. I, I'd like to say that, yeah, Google's definitely going to do this, but who knows these days. Uh, but basically, you can still consume quite a bit of memory, but you will see a bit of a reduction. So it's not night and day. Uh, but but is there is there any report on on a, like a reduction in um, you know the effectiveness of, of it anymore, or is it slower, or, or how are they getting this reduction without some kind of trade off? So the main way is they introduce a series of API calls in the, the Windows API that allows the browser to better interact with its cache as well as RAM and, and kind of optimize that storage. Right now, web applications, uh, not web apps, but web browsers like Chrome, each tab is kind of sandboxed and separated and isolated. And that means they've got to deal with separate caches and separate indexes and all sorts of things that make it kind of bloat in RAM. And with these API calls, it's allowing the underlying operating system to handle a lot of that for the browser on its behalf. So if the browser takes advantage of it, great, now we get a reduction. But if the browser doesn't take advantage of it, it still just runs the old way, where it's maintaining all of that isolation itself and ends up eating up quite a bit of memory. And I'm kind of tempted right now to look at exactly how much I'm consuming because it, it gets pretty impressive sometimes. And the worst part about tracking memory usage in Chrome is you can't just look at the one Chrome process. Yeah, there's all, all those up. Chrome task helpers mm. that you're like, oh, I'm only using 300. Me Hold on a second. One, two, three, four, five, oh, I'm using four gigabytes of RAM. Never mind. Never mind. I thought I was good. Yeah. Um, hmm. I know. Uh, and, and then the, the plugins, if you have plugins, each one of them gets their own thread and they consume memory. And I'm kind of looking at my list here. Uh, I have uh, two Chrome threads that are over 300 megs of RAM. I've got one Chrome thread at over 700 megs of RAM. I'm, I'm easily consuming two gigs of RAM right now. Uh, but I, I do have quite a few tabs open because that's how I roll. <laughs> All right, well, we'll definitely uh, put a pin in this one and come back and see uh, if Chrome or if Google uh, decides to roll this out uh, across Chromium and all the other, I mean, basically, what's left that isn't Firefox. Chromium based? Safari. Firefox? And Safari. And Safari. Safari too? Okay. Those are the two big ones. Uh, so, what I think is interesting is within this podcast, we have illustrated that Apple's idea of innovation is border radius. <laughs> uh, and Windows' idea of innovation and giving back is reducing memory usage in Chrome. I never thought I'd say this. I think I think Microsoft's starting to be the innovator in this group. Well, you know, I did I did leave off one of the announcements from Apple, which was that they uh, they've updated Safari, and they said it's the biggest update Safari has ever received since it was released. And my first thought was, I think this might be the first update <laughs> Safari has received since it was released. Um, so anyhow, we didn't report on it because there's nothing exciting there. Safari sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Don. Yeah. Go ahead and pull up a chair. Yeah, my, my daughter is uh, 
you know, when I'm showing her things in the computer before, she's like, well, what you do to, to go to this website? You open Safari. I'm like, no, no, you don't. She's like, yeah, that's how you get to the web. I'm like, no, you do not. <laughs> not in this house. You do not. You live under my house. That's you right. use or my roof. You yeah. use my web browser. Yeah. Did you know that opening Safari catches all of our 3D printers on fire? Oh, gosh. <laughs> all right. I'll be sure to open Just Safari. make up lies. Every time, yeah. Every time I walk by your machine, I will open that up. Uh, hey, we got a couple of webinars coming up. Uh, next month, July, is actually CompTIA month, so we've been focusing on how to get started in IT uh, here in June, and now in July we're talking CompTIA. And so uh, the first webinar on Thursday, Thursday, July 9th, is Stack Em Up, uh, Build Your Career with CompTIA Certs, How to Stack CompTIA Certifications for Your Career Path. Uh, so that's going to be taking place uh, Thursday, July 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, you can head over to itpro.tv slash webinars to register for that one. And then I think, um, uh, Daniel, you're in the second one, right? It's uh, security, secure your future with CompTIA certs. Does that sound like something yeah, you're doing? That does sound like something I'm a part of, yes. All right, that's July 23rd, and uh, you will be with Adam uh, and talking about security because they've got a bunch now. They've got, what, Security Plus, SISA Plus... Pentest Plus and Cast Plus, right? Is that everything? Yep, you nailed it. Nailed it. Well, I'm reading it, so. It does help. Peter Reed. wrote it right. Yeah. Reading Reed does. Reed Such good. a good reader. I read, yeah. I read good. He, he, he went to that Zoolander school. <laughs> you, you get a free personal pan pizza <laughs> yeah. at Pizza Hut. Man, I remember <laughs> that. My, my daughter got that, too. They, they're still doing that. Uh, okay. You know, up until a few... Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe they still. How do you out. think I feed my family? Man. Real quick, <laughs> you better read if you want to eat. So I remember, Secure. like in my hometown, like you could take your physical report card, which I don't. They don't give those anymore, do they? Yeah. No, you can print it out. Yeah, you can print it out. But you know, you had handwriting, and you could show it. And man, you could get all kinds of treats all around town: milkshakes and hot dogs. Do you think I have an appropriate class action suit <laughs> against those individuals for rewarding me uh, with horrible, horrible? Dietary choices. Uh, you, you did it to yourself with your good grades. Uh, well, they, they, they created an But it was reinforcing yeah. behavior. They addicted to me to milkshakes. <laughs> uh, and then they were like, you don't get any more A's. <laughs> if you were dumber, you would have eaten healthy. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, man, Just if I'd have been smart dumb. as hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that was fun. <laughs> I'm determined to find a class action lawsuit. Uh, yeah, yeah gotta, kind of find it on something. Yeah, yeah. We'll and then that. I'm going to call JG's wet word because I ain't yeah, standing up that cash now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now. I'm not waiting. This is my money. I should have it yeah. now. <laughs> Structured settlement, my ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we're so serious. We got rid of the jingle. We have a legit commercial now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think... Uh, there's got to be something about 5G, so you'll you'll find it soon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but let me know because you need. I don't know how many people you need for class action. If just two does it, so I'll find a class action that just affects gingers. Oh yeah. 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 Interesting. Uh, I'm in. <laughs> the sun. Uh, the sun. Can we we'll take a class action suit against Who's the sun. Who's responsible for this? <laughs> yeah, uh, get to the I feel like that. there's some court district that might hold up. Department of Energy. Yeah. They're like, yeah. you're right, the sun is horrible. We should nuke it. Well, this is the sunshine state. Like, they're obviously embracing it here in Florida. Yeah. We no, should... they're just observing the fact that the sun is trying to kill more people in Florida than other states. <laughs> than mosquitoes. <laughs> That's a tie. <laughs> By the mosquitoes way, too. have the mosquitoes been rough for y'all lately? No, because I stay inside. Yeah, have you been outside? Degrees. Yeah, I've been going outside because, you know, <laughs> That's there's cool. like that... I feel sad inside all the time. <laughs> ah, what's that like? Uh, well, nah, not really. But I feel like, you know, whatever. So I I got bit through clothing the other day. That okay. dog was By mosquitoes? Mean. Or? <laughs> yeah, by mosquitoes. Okay. I was like, going to get the mail. What is that? And then I sprayed it with some DEET, you know, deep woods DEET. And then it took it away from me and pistol whipped me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a mosquito. Yeah. It's gonna put You're that right. Out. I'm pretty sure it was a thug. See, and now everybody's worried about getting COVID, and Justin's going to come down with Zika. Oh. <laughs> yeah. or, He's uh, a pregnant woman. Or, or, or uh, was it Chagas? Uh, Chagas, yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Chupacabras? Chupacabras. Yeah, chupacabras. <laughs> My daughter is obsessed with Chupacabras right the now. The goat sucker. Yeah. I'm like, you understand it means goat sucker, right? She's like, goat That's sucker. I, <laughs> I mean, Chupacabras are kind of cool. I mean, if nothing else, it's very similar to Chimichanga. <laughs> Shit. 
It don't eat, you don't eat it, it eats you. <laughs> <laughs> so then head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado where you can get 30% off for uh, your subscription to IT Pro TV for your personal plan, and that's for the lifetime of your account. You can also get a seven-day free trial, and then you can fill out a form if you are a part of a business and want to find out how IT Pro TV can help your organization, and you can request a demo uh, for the Pro Portal and all the cool things that go along for teams. That's all over at go.itpro.tv slash technado. And then let us know, uh, you know, go on Twitter or something and talk to ITPR TV and tell us, would you rather we we continue to talk about the news or just just riff on mosquitoes and chupacabras for an hour? <laughs> uh, we're, we're always open to that. All right, guys, what, any votes here? Actually, I was just looking up, and apparently J.G. went or started off as a brothel. It was a different, it was a different <laughs> jingle, though. <laughs> They've changed it since then. But structured sediments are still involved. Yeah. Yeah. It's still about getting it now. <laughs> oh, man, uh, we are going to jail yeah. for slander. <laughs> Uh, uh, not uh, it. Will, <laughs> will a class action lawsuit take uh, Justin down before yeah, he yeah. can profit from it? It's not how week. he wanted to be in a class action lawsuit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's only slander if people believe you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and crap. it's not true. <laughs> None of that is true. It's all for satirical purposes of the website. I don't know. Do your own research, everybody at home, and find out. <laughs> but it, it sounds believable to me. I can see JG with a big fuzzy hat on. <laughs> <laughs> Go change, so he's got powder in his hand. I'm out. <laughs> anyway, Peter, you should get us out of here. It's about to yeah, yeah it's hey, about everybody, to get we'll off. see you next week. Uh, we've got uh, another great show next week, so definitely stay tuned for that, and we'll see you then on Technado with Tom Pazette. Bye-bye.